in the bulk of the discussion and all that, so this should be a bit quicker. Um, now we're moving on to 1848. So 1830 wasn't as big of a deal. Um, it didn't hit as many states, but 1848, these revolutions are the, uh, it's an example of the most, the widest spread of revolutions without coordination, because this wasn't like a coordinated effort. This just happened sporadically at the same time, or well, roughly the same time in a bunch of different states. Morgan. All right, uh, there is one element that's being added to this. So we still have a strong desire for nationalism and unification in Italy and Germany, uh, as well as a strong desire to break away from imperial control uh, for the Polish people and the Slavs and Hungarians and, and all of them that are currently to control somebody else. But there's that added element because it's 1848 and there's a much more uh, poignant class uh, struggle going on. I was say for economic conditions in Ben. That too, that's a, that's a starter, but like what's one uh, driving theme besides the usual discontent with famine and, and disorder? We already mentioned it earlier, by the way. There's a growing, at this point, a growing class of people that uh, want change and reform and freedom, and they're actually gonna join up with these people, even though they're not gonna agree on much, uh, and uh, uh, help stir and uh, drive these revolutions. Yeah, exactly, socialist ideas. Uh, are going to be popular, uh, and that's of course working class reforms are a big part of it. And uh, 1848, the year uh, the big work by Marx came out, Communist Manifesto, which we'll talk about next week, at least briefly. Okay, so there's three driving forces here, and uh, do these three have much in common? Is there something that's in common? At least between some of them. Yeah, what, what, what do we have commonalities wise? We can all agree there's a lot of differences. Um, so there's not gonna be much unison in these groups that work together, but like what's maybe one between? Okay, that's true, they want change. That's gonna unite them initially. Like we all have a common enemy, it's those guys. But once we get rid of those guys, the question is now what do we do? Because we all have different objectives, right? Uh, particularly these two groups. Uh, well, these two groups as well. The liberal movement socialists, as they want to have some equal opportunity. Yeah, they want expansion of suffrage and protection of rights and things like that. So that is the one unifying uh, ground here. But there's a lot of middle class people here, and they don't have a whole lot um, of sympathy or uh, desire to share or reduce their what's the word I'm looking for power uh, or influence uh, with the working class. So some, right? They both want expansion, but these guys. The middle class ones, anyway, they more so just want it for them, not for, for everyone below them, necessarily. Or maybe they want the protections, but they still want the laissez-faire policies to, uh, to reign supreme. Okay, so that's kind of the unifying uh, movement here, is these three groups do temporarily uh, have a common enemy. And who's their common enemy? You just say it, if you know it. Who are they all trying to get rid of? What? Yeah. The, the traditional authorities, right? So monarchs and nobles. So get rid of them, and that's actually be relatively easy for most of them, uh, but the problem is what do you do after? Because again, if these three, two to three groups unite, depending on the area they're in, once they kick out the leaders, they're all gonna have their guns still and all that, and then they're gonna be like, okay, now what? All right, and now it's not easy, it's not like a consensus, like, all right, now we want this. Right. It was easier in the United States because most people wanted uh, um, to form some form of government that was separate from uh, Great Britain, and they kind of had the same idea, like we want some freedoms and some local power. There were some details to hash out, but it wasn't like they wanted to two totally different things for the most part. There were some radicals, but they weren't, there weren't enough of them. All right, so uh, what's going to happen here, and this is going to be sparked again in France, again for the same conditions. Uh, 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 you've got the hungry 40s. We've, already, we've heard that term before, right? The potato blight. So things are already looking bad famine-wise in Europe. Um, the economies aren't doing particularly well as a result of that famine. Uh, so we have the same conditions for revolution in, in France, and that's where it's going to start in February. So France, this one's called the February Revolution. You don't need to know that, but I'll put it up there. Uh, in 1848, same conditions. Famine, poor economy. And uh, it's not that this monarch, Louis Felipe, is going to like do anything particular. It's just he kind of ignores 
uh, these uh, loud folks here. By the way, there are some people later that are going to note what happens if you don't pay attention to the complaints of these lower classes. You've mentioned it a couple times already. Okay, but what, what kind of a person is he? Yeah, yeah new conservatives, right? So uh, these revolutions are largely going to inspire guys like Napoleon III, Bismarck, Count Cavour, and others in Europe to be like, well, we don't want to give them these things, but what happens when we don't? Well, we, we get kicked out. So they realize they have to give some reforms even if they don't agree with them. So it's a little weird because you have like monarchs and people that are very traditional giving reforms to uh, liberals or nationalists or socialists, even though they don't agree with it at all. All right, um, so famine, economy, and then uh, Louis Felipe is uh, just going to essentially not support calls for reform. So all, you could basically just summarize it as ignores uh, reform calls of uh, any, anyone, nationalists, liberals, socialists, whoever it might be. He doesn't pay much attention to them. All right, uh, and that's going to result in him, of course, uh, there being a lot of animosity against him and eventually a revolution. But these are different than other revolutions, thank you. These are different than other revolutions. Grats. Um, these are different than other revolutions. Uh, these are going to spread just like 1813, but quicker or slower, do you think? Quicker. Why quicker? Just because? 18 years have gone by, so what's further developed? Because of how many revolutions there were before. Okay, that, that might be true, but I'm talking about how the word gets out. The word's going to get out even quicker this time. Why? I know 18 years have passed, but like specifically, what's been developing that's now going to make it easier to spread the word? Railroads. Yeah, railroads are much more connected. Uh, just the Industrial Revolution setting in, people are much, have a little bit more money right, to afford papers and therefore... Uh, sponsor the production of more papers, and they're more interconnected, whether it's roads or canals or railroads. Right, so the word's going to spread even more uh, quickly. Uh, this one is the widest spread. This one goes pretty much everywhere except for Russia. That's the one place it doesn't really get to, um, because Russia is just way far behind everybody at this point. Um, these are going to, of course, inspire revolts in, uh, inspire revolts in, uh, I, I'll just put pretty much everywhere, but I'll highlight the ones we care about. Uh, Austria is a big one. Uh, Italy is a big one, and uh, the German lands are the big ones. Um, they're going to be very successful because no one's ready for your entire population to revolt. And back then, it's not like you know they had drones and you know missiles and things like that. Like if they if your citizens had guns, well, that's all your government has too. So uh, guns and guns, there's not too much of an advantage if everyone has them and and you have a, a smaller amount of people that also have guns. Now it's different. Like. If we all got our shotguns and went to try to overthrow the government, they would just, we wouldn't even see the government. We'd just get vaporized from, by machinery. Not back then, though. All they had was guns as well. So they're able to rise up and kick most of them out. But here's the trick. Even though they are initially successful uh, and they kick out a lot of these governments, in fact, Metternich himself has to bail uh, from Austria, and they're not going to last. Why do you think these are not going to last? In fact, most of them get overturned fairly quickly. Uh, either through help from Russia or uh, by the return of uh, the, the old regimes. Could they have to do that really? Yeah, so they had no experience for governing most of them. But uh, do these guys all have common goals? No, no they're, they're pretty split on their goals. Like, they want to get rid of the people in charge, but as for what they want to do after, there's not really a consensus. So they're not united afterwards, and they also have no experience governing. Uh, so while we do have these spread throughout Austria, Italy, Germany, and all these areas trying to either break away from imperial control in Austria or unify in Italy and Germany, they're not going to last because, number one, Russia is relatively untouched, and they are going to adhere to this agreement, which means what? What would Russia have to do if they were agree stuck to this agreement on keep keeping things the way they were? Stop revolution. Yeah, they, would, they actually went around and aided these uh, governments in restoring the revolution, especially uh, in southern and eastern Europe. All right. Uh, and again, not united uh, to stop it and inexperienced uh, are these groups. So it's relatively, I don't want to say easy, but it's possible for uh, most of these revolutions to be overturned relatively quickly. So even though they rush the capitals, chase the governments out and all that, they end up coming back later and uh, they can't stop them because they don't know what they're doing, uh, they don't have control of the military, and uh, they don't agree and work cohesively in the first place. Um, so these are going to largely fail uh, due to inexperience, 
uh, and uh, disunity. Right, because these groups don't see eye to eye on what they want. Uh, there is one major attempt, though, to try to form a German Empire that fails. So what is that meeting uh, called and who turns down the uh, opportunity to take the throne as emperor of the German Empire? It's called the Frankfurt Parliament. Yep. And then the King of Prussia is going to Exactly. Frankfurt Parliament. And uh, the King of Prussia is going to turn down the uh, offer for the throne. Uh, so it's going to uh, delay a unified Germany. They will unite shortly later when they all work together with the Norman Ger Northern German Confederation, which is mostly Protestant industrial German states. They hook up with Prussia and other southern German states and uh, put the whooping on France and then unite, but that's a solid 15, 20 years away at this point. Uh, I think it's in uh, 1854, shortly after. It's not immediately during, uh, but it's shortly after that they try to uh, continue this uh, momentum and unite, and it's going to ultimately fail. Um, so denied by Prussia. And if you don't got Prussia, uh, you got nothing here, because that's the biggest, most powerful organized German state. If they're not going to agree to it, then none of the smaller ones are going to. Uh, so that's, that's why that one stops. Okay. Uh, but Russia does ultimately go through, and, uh, or the other regimes come back and are able to take power, uh, and most of it is undone. However, this is the last time that Europe's going to work together. Because uh, now, what's the, I mean, the cat's out the bag. What's going to be happening now is you're going to have a whole bunch of nationalism that's just like, it's like, it's like the water started boiling and they just put the cat back on, but they didn't. The burner's still going. Like, how much? How good is that going to do you? Let's pretend you're boiling water. You turn up the, the heat. Blah 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 blah, and it's boiling. And it's boiling. Like, oh goodness, it's going to overflow. I'll just put the cap on it, but I don't turn the burner off. What's going to happen? It's eventually going to overflow anyway, right? That's kind of a situation we have here. They put the cap on it, but the burner's still going. So yeah, they'll hold off for a few years, but by the time the 1860s and 70s come around, um, a conflict is going to unite Italy together. Um, agreements and conflict are going to unite Germany together, and uh, uh, Austria is going to have to start making concessions to its minority groups, like sharing the crown uh, with the Kingdom of Hungary, allowing uh, Croatia and Serbia to be autonomous regions, uh, even though they're still a part of the, they're a vassal of the state. All right. Uh, so again, the burner's still on, but they put the cap on it. But that's the last time, uh, because pretty soon, Britain and France are actually going to fight against Russia, and uh, these, uh, the feudal system's just, it's done at this point. This is where this is their last stand, and the next time uh, the conflict comes up, they put the stake in the vampire, and there goes the feudal system. All right, so that's kind of the significance of the uh, revolutions of 1830 and 48. Did a whole lot permanently happen? No, you had a few things, Greece, Serbia, uh, Belgium, get independence, you have some reforms in France, but what it does show is if you resist, your time is pretty much up, and uh, new conservatives are going to learn from that later. They're going to be like, well, if we just ignore people and assume they're going to keep listening, uh, we're going to find ourselves out of a job or dead. So that's when they're going to start making some concessions and reforms. So that's kind of the impact it has. It's the last stand of feudalism. It shows the rise of nationalism, and it's going to teach other generations of leaders that, oh, wait, we can't just ignore everybody. We actually have to make some concessions and listen, or we're doomed. Make sense? All right, cool.